This week, lots of fun and exciting news. Microsoft is bringing hardware-based isolation to Chrome and Firefox. The U.S. border's license plate scanning technology has been hacked. Crooks leverage WordPress and Joomla sites for malicious redirects. The Chinese military wants to replace Windows in fear of the U.S. hacking them, which is ironic. And how Google protected mobile browsers were open to phishing for over a year in other really interesting research in the realm of phishing. In our expert commentary this week, we welcome back Jason Wood from Paladin Security. We're going to talk about how almost 1 million are still vulnerable to Bluekeep. That's the remote desktop services vulnerability, which is CVE 2008-0708. I remember like 0708 is a really unlucky number for Microsoft. All that and more on this episode of Hack Naked News. This is Security Weekly, for security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show that brings you the security news each week. And despite popular belief, we do wear pants. It's Hack Naked News. Let the team at Black Hills Information Security test your defenses. With over 10 years of experience in penetration testing, red teaming, and threat hunting, the testers at Black Hills will help you find the holes in your security before the bad guys do. The team at Black Hills cares about educating and sharing their knowledge by creating countless blogs, open source tools, and webcasts for you to learn more about the tradecraft of pen testing and red teaming. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash BHIS to join their mailing list and view the latest blogs and webcasts from Black Hills Information Security. Welcome to Hack Naked News, episode 220 for May 28th, 2019. I'm your host, Paul Asadorian. Register for our upcoming webcast with Salt Stack, Domain Tools, and Logarithm. You can find all three of those webcasts on securityweekly.com forward slash webcasts. It's going to be uh, a lot of fun. So make sure you check them out. A little bit of education plus a little bit of knowledge about what the vendors actually do. So it's one-stop shopping for our listeners. Uh, if you missed any previous ones, you can find them at securityweekly.com forward slash on demand. And now the security news for this week. Microsoft is bringing hardware-based isolation to Chrome and Firefox. This feature was first introduced in 2017 and designed to isolate browser-based attacks. The container technology has only been available to Microsoft Edge until earlier this year, where Microsoft released Windows Defender uh, Application Guard extensions to Windows Insiders. The extensions leverage native application uh, and a native application rather that handles communication between the browser and the device's application guard settings and were designed to automatically redirect untrusted navigations to Windows Defender application guard for Microsoft Edge. So now you can get that same protection in that's available to Microsoft Edge for Chrome and Firefox on Windows platforms. Maker of the US borders license plate scanning technology has been ransacked by a hacker. Blueprints and files have been dumped online. This was an exclusive to the register. The attacker actually contacted the register and said, hey, look, I did this. Please run this story. So we'll give them credit uh, for everything I've seen today. They've handled the story very well. Uh, so the maker of vehicle license plate readers used extensively by the U.S. government and cities to identify and track citizens and immigrants has been hacked. Its internal files were pilfered and presently being offered for free on the dark web for download. The file names and accompanying directories, numbering almost 65,000, fit with the focus of surveillance technology business. They include .xlsx files named for locations and zip codes, JPEGs with names that refer to driver and scene, and document files associated with presumed government clients like ICE and date and timestamp JPEGs and mp4s interesting how these files are being released for free this is in fact from what the article has stated the technology used at u.s border crossings uh for surveillance as uh mexico and canada uh borders are actually using this technology according to the article and it's interesting how this was put out there for free uh i i would think you'd be able to sell that but apparently they're looking to make a statement Crooks are leveraging .ht access injectors on Joomla and WordPress sites for malicious redirects. 
Researchers at security are warning Joomla and WordPress sites, uh, admins of these websites, for malicious access to .ht access injectors found on a client. That sounds really bad. Basically, attackers are modifying your .ht access file and putting in redirects. Uh, I don't know why they couldn't just say that. The website was used by attackers to redirect traffic to advertising sites that attempt to deliver malware. Go figure. They stated that during the process of investigating one of our incident response cases, we found an HD access code injection. It has been widely spread on the website and injected into all HD access files and redirecting visitors to a URL that's in the show notes uh, that is an advertisement, which again leads to malware. Uh, it should be noted, this is the result of a breach, not the cause. If you're looking for evidence of your site being breached, one place to look and also monitor very closely. However, the report does not indicate how attackers gain initial access to the system. Although if WordPress and Joomla are involved, they've got many options. Chinese military is looking to replace Windows OS in fears of U.S. hacking. Now, this is not the first time I've heard of this. Uh, a few years ago, we covered a story about this, and this is the same story again. Maybe it takes a long time to come up with your own operating system, or this is just FUD being spread by the Chinese government amid, uh, it is the article states, amidst an escalating trade war and political tensions with the U.S., Beijing officials have decided to develop a custom operating system that will replace the Windows operating system on computers used by the Chinese military. Again, this is nothing new. We've covered a story like this a few years ago. The decision, it says, while not be being made officially through the government's normal press channel, was reported earlier this month by Canada-based military magazine, Kanwa Asian Defense. Per the magazine, Chinese military officials won't be jumping ship from Windows to Linux, but will develop a custom operating system. It does take a long time to create your own custom operating system. Good luck with that. I would say a better channel would be, or a strategy would be, to get the Linux kernel and build around that, and looking at all the Linux kernel source code and making sure there's no backdoors in it. Microsoft beefs up Wi-Fi protection. Microsoft has begun pushing out its May 2019 Windows 10 update, which will flag Wi-Fi networks that are using outdated and insecure Wired Equivalent Privacy, uh, better known as WEP, and Temporal Key Integrity Protocol, better known as TKIP, authentication mechanisms. I don't believe this is a practical security improvement as people in the security community obviously know that those protocols do suffer from vulnerabilities, uh, but many guest networks don't use encryption at all, which is a similar level of security as WEP, and not all that worse than, than TKIP. However, the users having a false sense of security that are connected to a secure network, right? The lock shows up and depending on which operating system and version you're using, um, that's a huge problem for security because the user thinks they're air quotes secure. So I like this change as it will alert the user that something is not secure and hopefully change their behavior. I almost said that with a straight face as I say that very optimistically. Nearly 1 million computers are still vulnerable to the wormable BlueKeep RDP flaw. 1 million systems are still remain on patch have found to be vulnerable to the recently disclosed critical wormable remote execution vulnerability in the Windows remote desktop or remote desktop services uh, suite of products. Of course, this uh, two weeks after Microsoft has released the emergency patch if exploited, obviously could allow an attacker to gain unauthenticated remote access, right? The typical uh, thing. They compare it to not WannaCry, not Petya. Um, it is tracked as CVE 2019-0708, which I think is hilarious and ironic as MS-0708 was really bad for Microsoft. Uh, this vulnerability affects Windows 2003 XP, Windows 7, Windows Server 2008, and 2008 R2. In Vista, as, um, I thought Vista was thrown in there, but... Uh, in any case, Windows uh, 8 and Windows 10 are not vulnerable. This number of almost 1 million systems come from, comes from Robert Graham, a trusted source uh, at Arata Security, revealed roughly 950,000 publicly accessible machines on the internet when Robert did his scanning, which I believe that number is pretty accurate and obviously will fluctuate over time. Speaking of Microsoft patches... Zero Patch has issued a micro patch to address the blue keep flaw in always on servers. However, of course, unlike Microsoft Security Fix, Zero Patch's micro patch doesn't require rebooting. The deployment of the security patch in always on servers sometimes is deployed normally 
uh, obviously because they don't want to restart them. You know, it's just a really long way to say you don't have to reboot your box when you apply the patch. At the time of the fix, works on systems running 32-bit Windows XP SP3. The expert does plan to port it to server 2003 and other versions. Not sure of the time frame on that. They released the source code as well, so you can review it before you apply this unofficial patch if you're into that kind of thing. Google protected mobile browsers were open to phishing for over a year. The real story is really the research that this group has done, which I think is pretty fascinating in how they've done it. The researchers created 2,380 phishing sites on new .com domains. They used one of five cloaking techniques. You can read their full paper that I linked to in the show notes to find out about all those cloaking techniques that they used that they called from real phishing sites cloaking techniques. So based on these techniques, um, along with the control group, they tested uh, the techniques against 10 anti-phishing mechanisms offered by major companies and only 23% of the phishing URLs crawled were blocked by at least one web browser. Uh, they also uncovered a huge gap, shockingly. Mobile Chrome, Safari, and Firefox failed to show any blacklist warnings between mid-2017 and late-2018, despite the presence of security settings that implied blacklist protection. Of course, you can find uh, the link to the article, but more interesting read is the research paper released this month titled Fish Farm, a scalable framework for measuring the effectiveness of evasion techniques against browser phishing blacklists, published by researchers at Arizona State University. With that, we'll take a short break. Come back for expert commentary with Jason Wood, where we're going to dig into, of course, CVE 2008-07-08. Stay tuned. The question is simple. Have any of the systems on my network been compromised? The answer is harder than it should be. Enter AI Hunter. Active Countermeasures has automated and streamlined techniques used by the best pen testers and threat hunters in the industry to create AI Hunter, a network threat hunting solution that does the first pass of a hunt for you to identify systems that are most likely to be compromised and scores the results on a scale from 0 to 100. You can then research those systems in depth with AI Hunter. Focus your valuable time on the systems that need your expertise with AI Hunter. Sign up for a personal demo today at securityweekly.com forward slash ACM. Welcome back everyone to Hack Naked News. Jason Wood is here with us to talk about those 1 million systems. Now I did mention there was 1 million. Why are there so many, Jason? <laughs> why? Uh, I have no idea. I looked why. in our patch management system and I was like, I, I want to know if we've got, you know, any systems that may still be vulnerable to this. And I was like, oh, we're, we're all Windows 10 here, so we don't have any vulnerable systems. I'm like, well, that was easy. <laughs> Covered it pretty quick, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it's definitely something that impacts the older versions, as Paul was saying earlier. Um, Microsoft's is it, is it official... Vista, Jason? Is Vista on that list of uh, vulnerable as well? I, don't, I, thought, I thought it was, but... I'm not sure, because Microsoft's bulletin on this, their guidance doesn't even list Windows XP in 2003 because they don't support it anymore. Mm -hmm. So they don't even want to talk about it. Um, so actually, I, I didn't look at this. Actually, I didn't even think about Vista. I did about 2008, 2003 and XP, but um, yeah, this is just something I try not to think about terribly much. Yeah, this is something you shouldn't be running anyhow, but yeah, so is XP, <laughs> to be quite honest. Yeah, it's unsupported, point, it's, right? Yeah, I mean, even Windows 7, I mean, you're talking about 10 years old. So, I mean, these are these are fairly old OSs, but you still run into them quite oh, a bit. But yeah, and as we know, enterprises still have these things uh, around. All over the place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Robert Graham had, uh, as Paul said, on, at Arata Security, wrote up a pretty interesting blog post about this. I'd like to say it's disturbing and surprising, but I'm not that shocked about the impact of CVE 2019-0708 otherwise known as Blue Keep. And Robert, has, if, you've, if you've read his blog post, he has no problem scanning around to see what's exposed and out there. And that's what he did. He turned around and he scanned the internet using mass scan for systems running RDP. Now, and these are anything listen to... Th Sorry, anything, I want to stop you there, Jason, because he right. scanned for port 3389, but did he right. somehow verify that it was... First that was of, where I was heading to next. Okay, sorry. Go ahead. I'll shut up now. <laughs> yeah, he used mass scan to scan the internet and say who's listening on three three eight nine. 
Then he started scanning down to see who's actually running RDP, and then he started checking into the vulnerability of the, each of those systems is trying to determine whether or not it was vulnerable or not. He uh, has got a tool that he posted about called RDP scan, or it's got the code for that in it. Uh, you can check it out to make sure before you run it, if, if he's doing naughty things in the code to, to compromise your system, if you want to look at that. Um, but essentially, you know, he did this because mass scans are very fast for huge amounts of the networks, you know, of huge networks like the entire internet. And um, I think he said it got done in a few hours. But then he used RDP scan to follow up. He says it's about a thousand times slower, but now he's dealing with a much mm. smaller list of systems. And he said he ended up with something like 7.6 million devices listening on 3389 on the internet. Of that, that's where we get down to the 950,000 hosts that are actually vulnerable to this issue. Um, so, yeah, he, he, one of his comments through this is, is he's looking at it. He says, you know, we've got a chance here to have a, a chance, like, like it's a good thing, uh, to ha experience something like WannaCrypt or, or not pet you again. WannaCry. But he made yeah. the uh, – WannaCry, sorry. Uh, and he made the comment, though, that uh, – but perhaps this could be worse because the attackers have more experience. They've had a couple of runs at some of these mass wormhole uh, vulnerabilities, and maybe now they'll turn around and apply that experience to this. We've had two weeks since the patch has been released. Uh, at this point, I'm sure it's being deployed to some extent, but we're still early on in that patch cycle. It takes enterprises quite a while to run through all of their systems. One of the things that I thought about as I was looking at this is we've got 950,000 hosts out there running older versions of Windows. These are probably less likely to be patched. Because if they were keeping up on that sort of thing, we wouldn't be running Windows 7 or 2003. Uh, so decent chance that they're not well-maintained systems anyhow. And so we're going to end up with a subset of this that isn't going to be patched at all. And we're going to have new systems that will probably be deployed for whatever reason, running these old versions, and not be patched. Uh, we could look at a worm running around here, and, and this is going to last for quite a while if it gets something like this gets released when it gets released. Uh, one of the things that I noticed that security organizations will think of, particularly when I was doing penetration testing, they'll have these one-off systems out there that they think, ah, it's not a big deal, it's not an important system, I don't care about this, and that's why I'm gonna expose it to the internet on 3389, that's why I'm not gonna patch it the same, things like that. But then these boxes are also inside their network. And, typically are joined, not typically, but frequently joined to some kind of domain. And then now we have this trust relationship between this unimportant system and uh, systems that are important to us inside of the network. And one of the things that Robert points out is that it spreads using this, uh, using BlueKeep. But then once it compromises the systems, there are a number of other techniques it can use to start spreading again. It can start looking through memory for credentials and then using those credentials mm -hmm. to spread to other hosts inside of the network. And this could get out of hand pretty, pretty quickly inside of organizations. Um, it's definitely something that I have seen at work as we're, you know, I stare at, it's been two years and I stare at systems every day that have been infected with WannaCry and have been cleaned up for some reason by the owners of the systems. Um, it's, uh, you know, there, there are preventions out there for this stuff. There are patches out there for it, and we're still watching it spread around. And you get it into some environments, and you can watch some of this stuff really take off. So this could be really a pretty rough ride out there, uh, particularly when you get into environments that have to lag on their operating system versions and patching due to some kind of certification or regulatory issues, medical environments come to mind because of devices that are a little reluctant to start making massive changes to devices that are controlling surgical equipment or things like that because, um, yeah, they, they, you know, there's a whole certification process that goes with some of these things. So that's a bit disturbing, particularly in that scenario you know, we saw with, with WannaCry where it was impacting actual treatment for patients because medical records, for example, were being locked up and people couldn't get access to those records to figure out how to treat this person. 
a little bit scary. Um, so yeah, I, I think, you know, it's something to, to be aware of the couple of points here. Microsoft makes a comment about, you know, some workarounds, one enable network layer authentication, um, mm. which, okay. But why is this thing, like Paul says, why is this thing on the internet in the first place? It shouldn't be. If you're yeah. enabling remote access to anything, it should be behind a VPN. 3389 should not be on the internet, period. Well, in uh, that case, neither should SMB. I mean... Neither should SMB. It would be yeah, a great know. comparison post to talk about the, the usage of the different protocols and how they differ exploitation-wise. I think one generalization that I'll make is <clears throat> patching SMB or configuring it, hardening it, has more impact to the user potentially who typically would gain access to file shares across the network as part of their daily job and mm -hmm. maybe not use RDP to get into a system that something more of an administrator uh, would have control over. Uh, so it, one could say it might be less impactful to patch this vulnerability with RDP versus SMB. But uh, they each carry with it, I think, their unique aspects uh, of usage and reasons why there's legacy usage of these either of these protocols. Yeah, I mean, and you get it, you start talking to organizations that have this, and sometimes they they're aware of it, and they've got all kinds of reasons why they can't apply this patch or they can't remove it, RDP from the internet. Um, a, sometimes it sounds to me just like a load of excuses um, because it's going to be work and a bit of a pain in the neck and users are going to get upset. But, you know, realistically, this is just bad security architecture to have this stuff hanging out there. And obviously, if we, you know, when we have things like this, I mean, patching is just part of the, the world we live in. So we need to get that stuff updated and hopefully get these operating systems updated to do something more, more recent. Um, and certainly the spread, once you pop, once you pop a unimportant system, it is not hard to spread laterally um, through an organization. It's certainly something I've done during yeah. penetration tests. Me too. Yeah. I, it's sometimes I've even gone to the point of making a little bit of noise to get some, an admin mm -hmm. to log in. And thank you very much for your credentials. I, you, know, you can do whatever you want on this box now, but I've got your username and password. And so then you get the, this, oh, wait those credentials aren't valid anywhere else in the organization. And it's like, well, have you tested that? Uh, no. Okay. I will. And yeah, I mean, exactly. like 99% of the time, right? There's at least one other system that is connected to the domain that has those credentials because they've been reused somewhere. And then it's pretty much like a, a, a straight shot to domain admin from there. Yeah. And I've even had people log into the system on making noise on as domain admin. Mm-hmm. So it was a it was a one step process, and that's what these you know worm like this could certainly do is periodically check do I have anything in credentials no or any credentials in memory? No, I'll come back a little bit later. Yeah, and eventually we're going to take a look at this box, and if we log in with a privileged account, it can grab those and start spreading. I think your so, older Windows operating systems that have RDP running, many of them I think fall in that category of special purpose system you know, supported by the vendor, but not patched by the vendor because it might break something. So RDP is there. So maybe the vendor or someone else can get into it, but they're not applying patches because it's going to break that special purpose built ecosystem that's connected to a device, a research system, a medical device, whatever the case may be. Right. I mean, we've seen that scenario a lot. Yeah. And, you know, if you, if you have one of those systems in your environment and you're talking to your vendor about it, feel free to push back on them about some of the stuff like, no, I've got to expose it, the you know, RDP. Everybody that runs these systems does this. It's okay. Mm -hmm. No, it's not okay. Push back. I remember getting into a fight with a, a phone vendor who wanted me to put Telnet out on the internet. And I was like, right. yeah, screw you. <clears throat> it's not happening. Uh, well, everybody does it. I don't care. Uh, you can be inconvenienced. So, yeah, it, it's all kinds of crazy excuses out there for it. Anyhow, the, the point of this is we, we've got a potentially serious uh, vulnerability out there. We've got experienced attackers. They've had, they've had a couple of runs at this already. So this could be quite uh, a rough ride for us when somebody writes a worm for this and it starts spreading. Uh, you know, hopefully it's overestimated, but, you know, the impact that, that Robert gives, but... Uh, I think he's got a pretty good shot at being just as bad as he says. 
So make sure you're, you got your patching, make sure you've got RDP not exposed to the internet and you're upgrading these systems to something more recent anyhow, if you can. Um, and that's, that's kind of what we, we're looking at here with this issue. Sweet. Jason, thank you so much. With that, that'll conclude the show. Thank you everyone for listening and watching and we'll see you next time.